Hi, everyone. This is Matthew Jenner for Car Runners, and I'm here with Out of Position 3-Bet Pot Play Part 4, Cut Off First Button Situations. So I have my setup, and another of the ranges have changed since the last video. That doesn't mean they won't eventually change, but I liked the way the Cut Off Cold Calling range was working against the Button 3-Bet from the last video, so I haven't changed it since then. And I'm going to go ahead and start randomly generating some flops. But unlike in the last video, I'm also going to randomly generate turns and rivers and talk about them as well. Even though we're mainly going to be focusing on the flop because that's when we have to make the toughest decisions because our range is the widest. I do think it's going to be interesting to look at certain turns and river cards as that will also give us a better idea of, you know, exactly how the button three betting range can look pre-flop or what exactly the button should be doing with regards to C betting on the flop. So we're going to look to see what we would do if we face multiple bets as you know, when we're in the cutoff and we face multiple bets from the button. Okay, so let's get started. So this was the first flop I randomly generated, and I've already been playing around with it a little bit. And the cutoff range has 56% equity, whereas the three betting range has 44% equity. That shouldn't come to us as a very big surprise for a couple of reasons. The first is with the range we're using, we have many more ace queen combos in the cutoff cold calling range than we have in the button three betting range. And in addition to that, even though this eight looks like it's not a high card, right? Right at the beginning, I talked about how two high cards tend to favor the um, the cutoff three bet calling range. But notice that since there's a queen and an eight, we not only make a couple pairs of eights with the nine eight suited, but this ten nine suited, jack nine suited, jack ten suited, all these hands make gut shots, which give us additional equity in the cutoff flatting range. So the fact that this is an eight rather than a, let's make it a five, you know, that's like 6 or 7% more equity. That's a substantial difference. So that's one of those things that when I talk about this in videos, and as you can tell, I had to I had to pause to analyze this for a minute. Like, I'm not that good where I can right off the bat immediately tell exactly how much equity the three-bet cold calling range has and what I should do with my entire range. Whereas I'm sure there are some players that are just quite a bit better than me that can just, boom, right off the bat have a much better sense. But if you just understand some, like, general patterns, hey, there's two sort of high-ish cards the fact that this is an eight rather than a five is going to give the cutoff, you know, cold calling range more equity. That is useful for helping us determine what to do. So here, since our range does have quite a bit equity, we're going to have to develop a donk betting range. Or at least I think, obviously you can't prove it, but I think a donk betting range is going to make sense here because our range has much more equity than the opponents. And we also have, you know, ace queen's just a very good hand. It's not beat very often. It's only beat, let's look, especially if we take into account the, whoa, the removal effects, ace queen's beat. You know, only 12% of the time on the flop, which just isn't that bad. Ace-Queen will also often have quite a bit of equity, even when it's beat. The other thing to note is if we do check to our opponent, the only hands I think the button's really going to want to bet on this flop, like the only like super clear bets, I think are going to be his Ace-Queen suited, his pocket Aces, and his pocket Kings. That doesn't mean he couldn't bet with hands like Jacks or Queen-Jack off or queen Nine suited, but he couldn't bet multiple streets with them very effectively. So he doesn't have that many hands that make super clear value bets, um, the reason why I didn't mention pocket queens, pocket queens could probably bet as well, but they have a pretty significant removal effect. So just notice that if we do check on this board texture, our opponent's probably not going to be c-betting all that aggressively if he really thinks, because the queen high board is probably better for our range than his range, and also the eight adds coordination, which favors us a little bit. Okay, so again, these are with the ranges I'm using. It might be a little different for whatever ranges you decide to use. Okay, so let's start with the value betting range. So we're going to want to make sure we're defending enough of our checks, but I think the sort of obvious value betting hands are usually going to be the 12 combos of ace-queen. And then I think we also can, we can bet some king-queen and we can check some king-queen. So I'm just going to start off with value betting half of the king-queen. Then I'm going to say we're going to check call the other half. We'll tweak it as we get a better sense for how many king, uh, how many queens we have in our checking range and how many queens we have in our betting range. But I'm just sort of starting out with putting in hands that seem reasonable. Um, Queen-jack suitor I don't think needs to value bet. Come on, buddy. Um, queen 10 suited. Now, one thing that's kind of neat to do, and I'm actually going to do it right here, is I think it, it makes sense to value bet with hands like 10s to 9s, because if I bet with 10s and 9s, I can maybe make my opponent fold hands that have one or two over cards. So let's go look at his range, and let's see. We had the button 3 betting range, 3 betting hands like king jack off, and then also I had some hands with just a single over card like ace 8 suited to king 9 suited. Again, this might change based on the 3 betting ranges you're using, but the general idea that we can bet sort of 10s or 9s for one sheet of value on this flop seemed very reasonable to me. Because if I bet pocket 9s and I make my opponent fold his ace-10 or his king-jack or his king-den or whatever he has, all those hands are reasonable for him to have. 
It's useful if I make them fold two over cards. So I like betting these tens to nines, even though they're not very strong value bets. They can probably bet one sheet for value pretty effectively. And remember, we're betting these tens or nines in a range that includes a lot of top pair top kicker. So our opponent can't just recklessly raise us. So, you know, this range will be balanced. You probably can notice that if you've watched a fair amount of my videos that I really like making high equity hands full on the flop when possible. So if you watch videos that are a few years old, I might not assign as much value to making our opponent fold like ace 10 off with the 10 of hearts when we have pocket nines as they do now. But it really is a big deal. Just to kind of showcase it real quickly, most people should know this, but it, it is good to actually be able to visualize it. If we had something like pocket nines and our opponent had something like ace 10 off with uh Let's just say the, the 10 of hearts, because he might not fold the ace of hearts. You know, he still has 20. He still has 20. Whoops. It's going to be like 28, probably. Yeah, he still has 28% equity. So very significant amount of equity that we can make fold if we bet something like 10s or 9s and he folds over cards. Okay. So we can also bluff. Let's just start throwing in the bluffs. So let's just start throwing in gut shots. So what, let's see what we got here. We'll say we're going to, how many flush draws do we have? We'll do those first, actually. All right, so let's say we're going to bet with eight flush draws. And then let's say we check call two and check raise two. You know, just, just throwing the flush draws everywhere a little bit. We don't want to have no flush draws in any of our ranges, really. So I'm just going to mostly bet with them because flush draws have good betting properties. They retain their equity well, and they can make, you know, they retain their equity well, and they can make hands that beat us fold. But I still do want to check raise or check call with some. Oh, for check, speaking of check raising, I would like check raising here with like aces without a diamond. So I was gonna, I'm going to put the three aces without a, or sorry, aces without a heart because there's two hearts on the board. So if I make my opponent, opponent fold a hand like king jack off with the king of hearts, you know, I don't want to make, if, if my opponent has king jack off with the king of hearts and I have pocket aces with a heart, it's awesome if he backdoors, you know, if he runner runners the second nut flush. So that's why I'd rather check call with aces with a heart and check raise the aces without a heart because I want to keep a few of my opponent's dominated hands in. And I'll be the first one to admit it's not very likely that my opponent runner runners are worse flush when I have pocket aces with a heart, but it can happen. So that might swing whether or not we check call or we check raise. So here I do like check raising some aces. So I'll check raise the aces without a heart. And then I think we can, um, you know, we can check a call with aces with a heart. It would be fine to check call with ace queen off with the ace of heart as well. There's no way of knowing for sure what's best here, but something like that seems reasonable. And now I'm going to finish doing the rest of the range myself because we've already done enough spots like this. So what I want to do is I want to have about one and a half, maybe a little bit less than that, but around one and a half bluffs for every really strong value that I had. And then I want to have less bluffs for these tens to nines because they're not going to bet multiple streets. So you're going to see me add in excuse me, a bunch of bluffs as well as just finish doing stuff with the rest of our range. I think I'm also probably, I also got to put our set of eight somewhere, so you'll see me do all that. Okay, so this is really interesting, which is why I stopped doing this on my own to talk for a bit. It's looking like our range is so strong here that it's hard to find enough bluffs. So we have so many good hands, and that actually kind of makes sense. Like, I'm just looking at this right here, which I wasn't paying much attention to earlier. Over half of our range is like nines or better, and I already was saying we could value bet nines for like one street. And then we have so many really good pairs and over pairs that it looks like this flop texture just hit our range so well that we might be able to bet our entire range on the flop. Because the other thing to keep in mind is I'm not seeing that many hands that work that well as there's some, there's a few hands that work well as check calls, namely just like queen jack suited and queen 10 suited, but that's pretty much it. We don't really have like any sort of like, we don't have that many hands like, you know, ace king or these like middle pair hands we really want to check a call with. So there aren't many hands that make sense, in my opinion, as check calls other than the six that I have highlighted. And we have so many strong hands that we can value bet. I moved all the king queen up to the value betting range trying to tweak things that I just think we're going to be able to bet our entire range on the flop. So by betting our entire range on the flop, we prevent our opponent from being able to see free cards cheaply. And our range is still going to be very strong on the turn. So usually why we, the reason why we don't bet our entire range on the flop is not only because we might have some hands in our range which don't really fear giving free cards, but if we bet our entire range on the flop, usually our flop betting range will be so, too weak. Here, this just doesn't really look like that's happening. Not only because our range had 57% equity when we were looking at Poker Stove, but because our range not only has a lot of equity, but it also just has 
a lot of strong hands, you know, 55% that are middle pair or better. And a lot of the hands we have are either really strong hands like the ace queen or better, or their hands like tens and nines, which I think work quite well to bet one sheet for value. So this is the first time I've seen the spot in a three bet pot cut offers button, but it looks like in this situation, we probably can justify betting our entire range on the flop. But if the board were maybe a little bit different, like if the board was something like this, you know, if we made the eight of hearts at three of clubs, I don't think that'd be the case. And I just plugged the queen two three rainbow into poker stove. And you can see that this range only has the cutoff cold climb range only has 52% equity then compared to the 56% equity of before. So pretty big change there. Okay. So I wrote some analysis here because there seems to be some interesting stuff happening. We didn't have a queen high board in the last video and I want to make sure we really absorb this. So I wrote, unsurprisingly, the queen high flop favors the three bet cold calling range. But the fact that the board is queen eight two rather than queen three two especially favors the cold calling range as that gives us more pairs, sets, and gut shots. Because of that, our range has four to five percent more equity on the queen eight two two tone board compared to the queen three two rainbow board. I also wrote, I think we should bet our entire range on the flop because we don't seem to have enough weak hands, so we're adequately check folding once we check. In other words, we can't make our betting range too weak by betting our entire range. So let me just pause for a second here and clarify this. What I'm saying is, is even if we, like, our range is so strong on the flop that we're just not going to ever really be check folding very often. So as soon as we check to our opponent on this flop, our opponent's going to just know that this is a bad board for him to bet. Again, he only has really aces, kings, and ace, queen suited that make super clear bets on the flop. And he should know that this flop hits our range quite well. So whenever we check here, our opponent's going to check back at a pretty high frequency, and that means it doesn't really make sense for us to ever check strong hands. So overall, as I've already explained you know, throughout the last five or ten minutes, it doesn't seem like a checking range is going to be all that effective. And I'm going to explain that a little bit more in just a second. So even if we bet our entire range on the flop, our betting range is still quite strong. Additionally, we have a lot of hands that work well as bets for multiple streets, such as eight queen, ace queen plus. So when I say multiple streets here, I mean it'll probably bet all three streets for value. Then we have hands that will bet two or three streets, depending on, you know, the runoff on the turn of the river, and that will be king-queen. And then we have other hands that will probably bet only one or two streets, and that'll be hands like tens or nines. If we bet tens or nines on the flop, we're likely going to end up checking it on the turn, and if we don't check it on the turn, we'll for sure check it on the river. So, as I mentioned before, we just don't really have that many hands that even want to check a call on this flop, other than maybe like queen-check or queen-ten. So the last thing I would notice, so either the queen-high board favors the cold calling range quite well, and there's no problem with the preflop ranges, or perhaps our cold calling range is too strong preflop. I shouldn't say that last part. So I'm thinking about our preflop range a little bit more. And if our range is just super, super strong on the flop, that means one of two things needed to happen. Number one is we just got a fantastic flop for our range. That's what I think happened here. We can clearly see that since we have a lot more equity on the flop than we did preflop, that it's probably a pretty good flop for our range. So that's one of the things that can happen for why our range is so strong on the flop. But the other thing that could have happened is maybe this range that we're using to defend against three bets, maybe we're defending with too strong of a range. So for example, since preflop is completely non-solvable, maybe in theory we were supposed to defend with you know quite a bit wider range against a button three bet. I don't think that's the case, but since this isn't solvable, that's something we need to have in mind. So if we constantly find that we're having just a super, super strong range on the flop and we can donk bet everything, then that probably means we should be widening our preflop range. So that way our, you know, we'll be defending more against th three bets and post flop we'll have, you know, more hands that we can use as check folds or donk bet bluffs. So. Right now, I think this preflop range is fine. I think we just got a really good flop for our range, but it's still something that I just want to be aware of. So keep that in mind. Since we don't have a flop check calling range, I'm not going to randomly generate a turn card. We, of course, could do that and then talk about what we do with our entire range on the turn. But I'm really you know, concerned with defending flop checks and how we play after we check call on the flop on the turn in the river. So I'm just going to generate another flop. And then if we have a flop check calling range, we'll then generate turns and rivers for the next one. So let's go. All right, so queen seven three. All right, we can do this. So this is going to be similar to the last one, but that's actually going to be really similar. The only difference is I don't even know if I want to do this. This might be similar enough. Let's let's look. So this does have quite a bit less equity. 
Okay, let's do this one, actually. I think we're not going to want to bet our entire range here. So let's go ahead and start plugging stuff in. All right, so on the flop, we have 102 combos. And let's start with saying we're going to value bet. Let's say we're going to value bet like the ace queen. Let's say we're going to value bet the nines and the eights. Um, we'll check all the tens. We've already talked about just from the last example why you would want to bet these hands for like one sheet of value. Betting the tens would be fine too, but I'm just going to check call with them here. Board's a little bit drier. Um, okay. All right, so then now I'm going to go ahead and just fill out the rest of this stuff sort of on my own. I'll talk about the stuff after I've done that. So this is what I came up with. It looks reasonable to me. I'll talk about the more important things. You'll notice there's a lot of hands that are going in both ranges. Sometimes I'm betting aces. Sometimes I'm check calling aces. So aces, for example, you could easily make an argument, for, I think, for check calling aces, which would be, well, you know, you're not afraid of giving any free cards when you check call with aces. So by check calling, you allow your opponent to turn, you know, a weaker pair. So like, for example, if we check and our opponent has ace jack or king jack or something like that, aces aren't afraid of giving a free card. So our opponent can turn a worse pair. So that's the advantage of check calling with aces. The advantage of betting, though, is aces are a really strong hand that can bet three streets very effectively. King queen, it's a little bit, I'm both checking and betting king queen. King queen's a little bit riskier to check because the turn can come in ace. But it's also going to be harder to go bet, bet, bet with king queen and get three streets of value. So I put these hands in both ranges. Um, ace queen I'm always betting with. And then as I already mentioned, we're betting the nines and the eights and check calling the tens. So here on this flop, we're betting pretty aggressively. We're betting, it should be 64 out of 100. So we're betting about 65% of the time. So the flop C bet is equal to 65%. And then we're defending 71% of our checks. So this is a range where we're once again very easily able to defend our range, either by a combination of betting or check calling it, because the queen high board favors us so well. Notice for bluffs, I'm just donk betting a ton of 3 to a flush, 3 to a straight type hands. Those are pretty much the best bluffs we have here. So those are the hands we need to use, and they'll double barrel very, very effectively. Okay, so I again want to do some analysis on this because... You know, I'm seeing a lot of this stuff for the first time. So you can clearly see how if this flop were to come queen 7-3, our opponent would be in really good shape against this range if he had ace-queen. So that makes me think that the button should be three-betting ace-queen off more aggressively pre-flop, because right now this is the range we had, whereas maybe the button three-betting range should look something more along the lines of, I'm just going to make it up right now, something along the lines of, of something like... Uh, I want to pick some three-bet bluffs. You know, something along the lines of this. Especially if we're going to three-bet, if the button's going to three-bet smaller in position. So, in order for something to theoretically make sense, every single hand has to always take the most plus EV line. So here, it's not okay for the button to ever call a cutoff open with ace-queen off if three-betting is more profitable than flatting. Now, we don't know if three-betting is more profitable than flatting. Because the advantage of cold calling with ace-queen off against a cutoff open is, you know, if the cutoff opens and you flat with ace-queen off in the button, you keep a ton of his dominated aces and a ton of his dominated queens in the hand that you make fold when you three-bet ace-queen. On top of that, even though I think most people would agree with me that if you three-bet ace-queen and get called by this range, you're doing quite well, the problem is, is if you get four-bet, that sucks to be holding ace-queen in face of, uh, face of four-bet. So again, we still don't know whether or not, in theory, it's better to cold call with ace-queen off pre-flop against the cutoff open in the button, or whether or not it's better to three-bet. My guess is, in theory, we should still do a combination of both. The other nice thing about cold calling with ace-queen off pre-flop is the hand does reasonably well against squeezes it can call, um, you know, squeezes from the blinds. So it's still very tough to say exactly what's better to do, but since I'm looking at these ranges and I'm just looking at how rarely ace-queens beat here... And just how aggressively, like, when the cutoff gets a range, when the cutoff gets a flop like this against a button three betting range that looks like this, the cutoff should probably be donk betting a lot. So that means if we were to have three bet in the button with ace queen and we get a flop like this, we expect to get paid really, really well when we have ace queen because the cutoff will bluff with a bunch of hands. The cutoff will check call with some air in some much weaker hands. And we just are only really beat by pocket aces here. 
So it's still, I know I'm repeating myself here. It's still tough to say what to do with ace queen off when cutoff opens and run the button. But now I'm even more interested in the idea of three betting it a bit more aggressively, especially if we're three betting smaller. Because by three betting smaller, let's go to the cutoff, um, the button three betting range. By three betting ace queen smaller, we might make, you know, the cutoff defend a three bet with something like ace 10 off and ace eight suited as well, which would, of course, you know, keep the dominated hands in when we when the button holds ace queen. So tough to say, but as I'm looking at these board textures and I'm looking at how aggressively the cutoff will play queen high flops, I'm starting to like three betting ace queen the button against the cutoff a little bit more. So I wrote the following analysis. The cutoff cold calling range is currently doing very, very well on queen high flops. This encourages the cutoff to value bet and bluff aggressively, which means if the button were to have ace queen, he'd be paid handsomely. So I think the button should adjust and three bet ace queen a bit more aggressively preflop, which will cause the cutoff to adjust and not play queen high boards as aggressively. In other words, while I still do think in theory, cold calling and three betting ace queen on the button should have the same EV, I think we need to be three betting more than just the suited combinations. So if the button were to always three bet ace queen, I think that probably would be a little bit exploitable. The button would be a little bit too vulnerable to squeezes, and then the button might miss on queen high flops and single raise pots, so that's probably not ideal. Yet, as of right now, the button's probably not three betting aggressively because he's missing too much on queen high boards and three bet pots. So hopefully you understand all this analysis and why, even though in theory, both cold calling and the button and three betting in the button against a cutoff open with ace queen, I think should have the same EV. We need to be three betting a higher fraction of them than just the suited combos. So if you look here at the cutoff three bet calling range, I still think this range is awesome here. This hasn't changed. I now just think this range right here, the button three betting range, this should be tweaked a little bit. More specifically, I think we should add in some more ace queen offs. That might even be the only thing that really needs to be tweaked. But I just think it does need to be um, connecting a little bit harder on queen high flops. And so one way to do that is just by adding in the ace queen. So now let's randomly generate another flop. Okay, I don't really want to do another queen high flop. We've done enough. Oh, come on. All right, let's do this one. Ten of clubs, six of spades, three of spades. All right, so total combos is going to be 104. All right, so let's plug in the equities first and then see. Let's see how much equity our entire range has first, and then we'll worry about whether or not we have a donk betting range or whether or not we're only defending our checks. And here we see our cold calling range is going to go from having 50% equity to 53% equity. So this is a board that increases the overall equity of our three bet calling range. So that's a good sign. And then the next thing I would sort of just conceptually start asking ourselves first is is this a spot where we have. How valuable is position here, and how is our equity distributed? So does this look like a board where position is very valuable, and is our equity distributed in a really good way here? And remember, the best way equity can be distributed is in a perfectly polarized range. So we love it when we have a case where we have like pure nuts or pure air. So how close are we to having you know a polarized range? How close are we to having a condensed range? And then how valuable is position here? So this might be a good time to pause and ask yourself before I explain what I think. And, you know, you can just see how close we are on that. So let's do one question at a time if you've hopefully paused and are done. So how valuable is position? I think position is going to be pretty valuable here. Low boards tend to favor position more because there's just a lot of turn cards that can change the strength of hands. And on this board in particular, there are flush. there is a flush draw. The board's a 10 high board, which is, you know, on the lowish side, but not that low. Most boards are jack higher, higher. Sorry, most boards are jack higher, higher, but 10's not that low. Um, and there's also a lot of gut shots here. So when you combine all three of those things, they're being flush draws, a bunch of gut shots, and then they're also, you know, being a 10 high board rather than like a queen or a king high board. I do think this board's position is going to be more valuable than usual on this board. The next thing to talk about would be how our equity is distributed. And that's where I imagine we're not doing too well. So let's look. So our three bet cold calling range has an over pair or better 8.6% of the time, whereas the three betting range has an over pair or better 22% um, of the time. So that's a huge difference. So because of that, even though our range has more equity than the opponents, we're out of position when position matters a lot, and our distribution of equity doesn't seem very good relative to the opponents. Like, 
Um, now, this is probably a small mistake in the range right here. But if you look, this range doesn't even have any just top pair hands in the three betting range because I ended up call, I ended up calling preflop with the ace, 10, king, 10, queen, 10, jack, 10 suited. And I um, didn't three bet bluff, ace, 10 off. We've talked about this several times. I know it's getting repetitive, but I just want to make sure everyone's clear on this. You probably would three bet bluff, ace, 10 off sometimes. It's just rather than assign all these different weighted bluffs, this is what I put in. So if we take that into account, then not only would the three betting range have a little bit more equity, but it will also have some top pair hands. But at the end of the day, the most important thing here is just really to understand how, since the cold calling range only has an over pair of better 8.6%, whereas the button has that about three times as often, chances are we don't really want to have a flop donk betting range here because we just don't have that many hands that want to bet three streets for value, whereas our opponent does. And also, this is a board texture where, you know, when our opponent has a lot of hands like queens and jacks, he's going to be very, he's not, you know, he's always going to value bet those hands. So, at the end of the day, I, I'd say we don't want to have a donk betting range here. Or if we do have a donk betting range when we're out of position here, we would want to donk bet very, very small. I've talked about in other theory videos how when you're out of position, if you bet really small or if you check, they're kind of fundamentally very similar. I've encouraged people to look at checking when they're out of position as betting zero. So it's quite possible. I, I almost want to even say it's likely here with the ranges we have that it'd be theoretically correct for the cutoff to make a very small donk bet at a very high frequency. But that's just one of those things that's very difficult to implement. Even if you understand it theoretically, I've never really seen anyone implement it that effectively. So at the end of the day here, I would say, you know, we're trying to figure stuff out here. Let's start with not donk betting anything and then see how we'd have to defend against our opponent when he bets all three streets. So that's one of the things that we wanted to do with this video series to begin with is, you know, sort of get a feel for how strong our range will need to be when our opponent goes bet, 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 and we call down. So let's go ahead and use uh, this as an opportunity to see that. So we're not going to bet anything here. We're going to check all 104 combos. And since our range does have more equity than our opponents, I think we're, I think we're probably going to be able to defend pretty aggressively on this board, but let's go ahead and see. So I'm going to use my calculator to see if we defend. So 70% of 104 is just going to be like 72. So we can put that in, you know, let's just write ourselves a little reminder that we want to sort of defend 72 hand combos. All right, let's go one at a time. So let's start with just putting in the really obvious hands. So I think we would want to, I think we would want to check call with all of our um, pairs of tens. Our, once, once again, our opponent has us beat over a fifth of the time on the flop with his over pairs. I don't think we're going to want to check raise these hands. So let's just go ace 10 suited, king 10 suited, queen 10 suited, jack 10 suited, which is 12 hand combos. All right, let's also check call pocket nines and pocket eights, which is 12 hand combos total. All right, so let's talk about a check raising range for a bit. So usually I want to check raise with hands that are really strong yet vulnerable for value. Like, for example, a hand like pocket queens or pocket kings might make a really good check raise here. And then also, since those are my value hands, I want to, you know, have bluffs, you know, hands that retain their equity that can outdraw the opponent and then some draws. Here, what's kind of tricky is all of our really strong hands aren't really that afraid of giving free cards. So... I'm still going to check raise aces without a spade, I guess, because I want to have some check raising range here. But both with pocket aces and pocket tens, I'm just not afraid of giving free cards. So, you know, I don't have an idea, you know, the ideal value check raise hands. So I'm going to put three aces in each range. And I think I'm going to go ahead and check call tens because I'm just not really afraid of anything. It's only three combos. But yeah, I want to have some check raising range so my opponent, when he bets, isn't guaranteed to always see the turn card. Then with that, I'm going to say, let's see how many flush draws we have. And we don't, we don't want to double count the pairs, so we have to subtract four from the 13. So we have nine flush draws. So let's just say we're going to check raise three flush draws, and we'll say we check a call with the other six. And then, let's say, so we have three aces, three flush draws. And let's say we check raise bluff like another, you know, three or four hand combos. So we'll get to that in a bit. Okay, so let's keep, so we have we have a lot more hands that we need to defend. So I'm going to go ahead and keep writing stuff down. So I'm going to go like ace, queen, seven, um, king, queen, seven. So this just means the ace, king, or the king, queen with the backdoor flush draw. So like king, queen with the clubs or with the, just a spade. And then let's see, anything else we have? We have nine, eight suited. So let's, let's check raise the nine, eight suited that aren't the flush draw. So nine, eight suited there. Then now I'm going to start counting these hands up. So I'll pause that while I while I tally this up. And we're still going to be a ways away, I think. 
So right now we have 59. So I'm going to try to get a few more. So let's add in the 16. Com- let's add in the, the other eight combos of Ace Queen. We don't want to double count the flush draw. So that will get us to 58. And then one thing that I've been doing a lot, which I, I think just helps me to sort of visualize this stuff better, is so initially when I was just writing this down a minute ago, I you know said like let's start with defending the Ace Queen with the backdoor flush draw. Let's see how much equity Ace Queen without the flush actually has, because I think one leak that I have is and. This just has to deal with when I was playing how I actually played and then how most people still talk about poker is I'm probably just folding too much. You're able, you know, you're especially a while ago when players were weaker, you were just eight. If you, as long as your overall game is pretty solid, you're able to fold hands that probably in theory are only like slightly plus EV and you can just get away with it and still win pretty well. But that's really exploitable for one thing. Like if, you know, if you're not defending a lot of those hands that are slightly plus EV in theory, then your opponent can exploit you by playing too aggressively against you. And also just at the end of the day, you know, I want to make as few mistakes as possible. I shouldn't be folding plus EV hands. So could be wrong here, which is why I'm looking, but I'm guessing I'm going to find like ace queen has a lot of equity against this range. And it does. It has 46% equity. And this is, again, this is the ace queen without the back for flush draw. So I was originally going to fold a hand that had 46% equity when I'm probably getting around 3-1 to one immediate odds on the flop. And it's okay to fold high equity hands on the flop if the equity is, you know, a bad type of equity. Like, it's often going to turn the worst hand and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day here, we're getting 3-1 to one odds. And then ace-queen, yeah, you know, sometimes we're just going to get cored when we turn an ace and he has ace-king, or, you know, we turn a queen and he has pocket aces. But for the most part, ace-queen can win at showdown pretty easily with ace-queen high. And if it turns an ace or a queen, that's awesome. You know, we're going to be in pretty good shape, especially if the ace or the queen is not a spade. So I think it was probably a mistake for me to want to initially fold that. So it's one I got to get better at not making. And right now, right now we're defending 67 combos. So we're five combos short of defending 70% of our range. And that looks good enough to me. So I'm going to try to see if I can find anything else that I think we kind of missed. So maybe, for example, what we could do is we could also defend something like queen jack of clubs. That, that just seems like a tricky hand to check raise that would double barrel really well on the turn. Um, you know, stuff like that. We can maybe even check a call. So I, I, I'm just putting hands down. You can, so, because I know there's going to be some nits that watch this video. So let's put the queen jack of clubs up here because it's a little bit better. And we'll put jack nine of clubs down here. And these are just, you know, jack nine of clubs can easily check raise the flop and then double barrel the turn. Queen jack of clubs is a pretty weak float, but it's, it's very tricky, which is kind of nice. So that gets us to... That gets us to 69 commas. We're trying to get to 72. So maybe we could add one or two more. But again, this was just an estimate. So it's really not that important for a few combos off. So um, take a minute to let this all sink in. It looks to me like a pretty reasonable range. Let's kind of just play around with it a little bit more. So we've got 12 top pair hands, 12 middle pairs, six amazing hands, six draws. Most of these draws are going to be really awesome. And then like 24 or so hands of you know, kind of crappy stuff. And ace-queen does, even though ace-queen, ace-queen does have showdown value. So ace-queen's kind of a hand that can both improve and just win at showdown. Okay, so this seems, you know, pretty reasonable to me. It seems like a, it seems like a very reasonable range that we're going to be able to play on the turn. So let's go ahead and randomly generate that turn now. All right, so I'm going to lock the flop. Three, two, one, blast off. All right, so the turn's a three of clubs. So that's a fun one. Okay, so that shouldn't change any combos we have. So we still have 104 combos in our overall range. So what that means is is none of these hands in our check calling range were blocked by this three of clubs on the turn. Whereas if the turn was of, you know, jack of hearts, then of course that would block some hands in our range, like it blocked jack ten of hearts, for example. Okay, so let's do it. So we have the three of clubs on the turn. We have 59 hand combos. So hand combos, 59. And then let's see, you know, uh, defending range. So let's try to defend around 67% here, 70% here. So I'm going to go, so this is around 60. And then if we want to defend 70%, 60 times 0.7, that's going to be 42. So we want to defend, you know, maybe 40 to 41 to 42 combos. All right, so let's just go ahead and start it off. So the first thing we can do is on this turn card is I would start say we're going to you know, so let's say we want 40 to 42 combos. Let's just get rid of the check raising. So let's say we want to check raise with like the three combos of aces and then like two flush draws, something like that. Um, so that'll let us check raise five hand combos. 
Because remember, we don't want to be bluffing too aggressively here when we chuck raise all in because our opponent's getting an awesome price. So off the top of my head, I think we'd want probably two flush draws for three value hands. This, of course, isn't going to be super precise, but it's probably reasonable. And then we want to defend like another 30 or 35 combos by check calling. So I'm going to check call the pocket tens. I don't hate it if someone wants to check raise all in here. But again, I usually like to check raise with strong, vulnerable hands. That's what aces are right here. It's a strong hand that can still be outdrawn by gut shots and flush draws. So to me, that's like, awesome, let's check raise it. Whereas pocket tens, it's like, oh man, I'm nutted. So because of that, I would just check call and let my opponent keep bluffing. But the reason why check raising pocket tens here can be more effective than it usually is, is because our opponent might be bet calling in the turn with some draws. So, you know, I, I would probably check call the tens, but I don't hate check raising all in. All right, what else do we have? Ace ten suited. I'm just going to pretty much cut and paste. So let's see. We're going to cut and paste probably this right here. And then how many flush draws do we have? We have four flush draws left. So I think we're probably going to defend any of those. So let's do that. Flush draws, four. So we have six, 18, 30, 34. So that's 34 plus five. So that's 39. So we're just a little bit short. Um, okay, and let's just put the jack, the queen jack of clips in since we turned the, since we turned the flush draw with it. And then, even though I put the Queen Jack of Clubs down here, I think we'd probably want to check raise the Queen Jack of Clubs and then maybe take one of these flush draws and check call with it. Because ideally on the turn, like the kind of flush draw that I'd want to check call with on the turn, and pause for a moment and think about this. What flush draw do you think I'm going to say we should check raise on the turn? And what flush draw do you think I'm going to say we should check call on the turn? Pause for a moment. You really want to get this one right. I would want to check call with the Ace Queen of Spades. Because that hand can still win at showdown. If I check call with the ace, queen of spades on the turn, then if my opponent just gives up on his bluff on the river, I can still win. Likewise, if I check call with the ace, queen on the turn, my opponent might double barrel with a hand like king, queen, and then we can both, you know, turn a pair of queens on the river, and then I win. So a lot of people would, I think, incorrectly think, oh, let's check raise all in with ace, queen of spades on the turn because it's so strong, because it's the, um, you know, the nut flush draw. No, you, you probably don't want to do that because that's the one that can win at showdown. And I also just realized we'll have stuff like ace, queen of clubs in our range too. So this flush draw will include spades and clubs. So we, we have even more flush draws than I have listed right here. Um, so yeah, so just, so we probably, for example, we probably wouldn't even check call with, I think, yeah, we check call probably on the turn with ace, queen of clubs and not. Sorry, we check, yeah, we check call the turn with ace, queen of clubs, then we probably check raise with like queen, jack of clubs. So to make that as clear as possible, the flush draws I would want to check raise with are the ones that are going to be drawing to like some sort of tainted pairs and have no showdown value. So queen jack and clubs would probably be a little bit more reasonable to check raise on this turn because the same way I could turn a queen against my opponent's king queen, you know, this is once again assuming king queen's in his range, he might not three bet that button versus cutoff like we don't have it in this in our ranges here. But if he if he did have king queen, I don't want to turn a queen and be shown my opponent's queen king or my opponent's ace queen when I have queen jack. Whereas if I have ace-queen and my opponent has queen-king or ace-queen, so I either beat him or I split, that's more acceptable. So I'd rather check-raise with the flush draws that are going to draw to tainted pairs, and I'd rather check-call with the ones that can have, that will, you know, sometimes river the best pair where my opponent had a tainted out. Then the last thing I would mention is, since we have so many flush draws on this turn, on, on this board texture, since the turn gave us the three of clubs, which would give us the, um, the ace-queen of clubs and the king-queen of clubs, it's even possible we might not defend all of our flush draws. I think we probably would, but it's, it's possible we might not. So now let's look at this range again and talk about it a bit more. So overall, this range has three nut-type hands. So almost 10% of our range is pretty much the nuts. A lot of top pair hands. A lot of these really vulnerable middle pair hands. And then a couple of draws. And hopefully these draws have some showdown value so they can win um, if the opponent checks through sometime. You know, not always, but sometimes. This looks reasonable to me. Like, I like the way this is looking, which is making me still continue to feel good about these ranges that I've been using. And the one thing I would notice is I know in practice, I just hate having pocket nines and pocket eights here. So I just want you to understand that if you check call twice with pocket nines here, even though we got a good turn card, when we check call on the flop, we're really rooting for our opponent to check back the turn. Because if our opponent bets this flop or this turn or this river, a lot of times he's betting with a really polarized range. Let's go back to look at it once more. You know, this was the range. This was a polarized range for the most part when he bet. 
you know, aces, kings, queens, jacks. Those are all really, really strong hands. He might have bet like ace, king for a single street of value. So there are some hands he could bet for one street of value. Likewise, he also has a couple sixes in his range. But for the most part, when we have, you know, when we have a hand like pocket nines and our opponent has a polarized range and, you know, pocket nines are very vulnerable to being outdrawn, when we check a call with him, we're really rooting for our opponent to check the next street, especially if he's balanced. Because if he's balanced, then we know we're kind of indifferent to calling or folding with a lot of our bluff catchers, like nines or eights. So it's okay to check Holly's hands on the turn. I know we're not happy about doing it, but they're still pretty good hands. And then we're just kind of saying to ourselves when we check call on the turn, please, you know, pl- I really hope my opponent checks the river. Please check, please check, please check, please check. Because if we have pocket nines and our opponent checks the river, we're probably going to win. If we have, you know, pocket nines and our opponent bets, if he's balanced, we're going to be indifferent to calling or folding. And one more time, there are, this is not the exact range people will use. This isn't the theoretically perfect range. So there should be probably some like ace 10 off or maybe a couple random suited 10s in our opponent's range. And if that's the case, it's going to be a little bit more likely that, than he goes, that he goes like bet flop with, let's say, 10-8 suited, bet turn with 10-8 suited, and then he checks the river and we still lose with nines. But that's totally fine. That's how, you know, theoretically correct poker will be played. Sometimes we're going to check call with a hand twice when we're behind. And sometimes we'll, you know, ch- check call twice only to face a river bet, even though we're pretty disappointed with that. And that's okay because we're getting such an awesome price on the turn. Okay, a lot of talking. So let's randomly generate that river card. All right, let's lock the turn and... Push. All right, so we got the six of clubs. Kind of weird that both the turn and the river were the clubs pairing the board, but what are you going to do? All right. So hand combos, that's not going to reduce any hand combos in our range. I mean, I can just show you just in case there's any any doubters in the crowd, but there's still 104 hand combos. So nothing got reduced. Okay, so we have 35 combos, 35 times 0.7. So let's just do it in our head. 30 times 0.7 would be 21. And then if we take 5, you know, 5 times 0.7, that would be 3.5. So we're going to want to defend about 24 hand combos. We could probably even defend a little bit less than, you know, 70% since there are no implied odds for our opponent's hands. So with all that in mind, let's say we want to defend like 22 or so hand combos. So 22 hand combos, and then so check. We're not going to dunk that here, so we're going to check call the, the 20, 22 best hands. So let's see. That's going to be about, probably about three flushes. I'm not even going to count flushes. For, I, I am going to count. Come on. Okay, so let's say ace, queen of clubs. King, queen of clubs, and queen, jack of clubs might have been check raised. How many did we have on the turn? I don't think we were check raised. So we probably check called king, queen of clubs on the turn. So ace, queen of clubs, king, queen of clubs. Do we have another one? No, that's probably it. All right, so in that case, we only have two flushes. All right, tens is going to be three hand combos. Ace, ten, king, ten suited, queen, ten suited, jack, ten suited. Uh, that's going to be 12 hand combos. And then... All right, so that gets us to 12, 15, 17. So we have 17 right here, and then we'd also end up check calling with apparently uh, the nines. So that gets us to 20, that gets us to 23. So let me just make sure. I'm, I'm just double checking this as I do this. So we have, you know, that's 18, yep, 23. Wait, I double counted ace 10 suited here by accident in the last example. Okay, so let me fix that. So it appears I made the mistake of not adding in 10-9 suited when we'd made our check calling range on the flop. And then for the last, um, when we were doing the turn, I accidentally put ace-10 suited twice. So I just replaced the ace-10 suited with 10-9 suited here. So this happens actually pretty often when you're doing this stuff on your own where you just miss a hand combo or you miswrite something. It doesn't matter even if you don't catch it, although luckily we caught it here. It rarely changes anything significantly. So right here on the river... Um, we're go- I apologize, by the way, if you noticed that and it was bothering you, but on the river, we have two flushes, three full houses, 15 combos of, uh, top pair, and then three combos of pocket nines. We're only defending half of our pocket nines on the river. So this looks pretty reasonable to me. And we are getting to the river with, you know, a relatively weak range after having gone check call, check call, check call here. But we have some really amazingly strong hands in our range on the river, these hands. And then we have pretty much all these hands right here, which are just beating our opponent's bluff catchers. Because our opponent's mostly value betting with queens, jacks, um, kings, those types of hands. So this looks really reasonable here. This, of course, assumes our opponent's balanced. 
Because we have on the river, like, we have access to these pocket nines and pocket eights. So if we think our opponent was bluffing, you know, if we thought our opponent was bluffing too much, we could call with all these hands on the river. If we thought he was bluffing too little, we could fold all these hands. In reality, though, I would try to play... See, I don't want to give this advice because it might not... Because so many people that watch this play such different stakes. If I were playing right now, if I were playing No Limit 200 right now in some place like Stars, I would probably try to defend with this actual range here because you never know when your opponent, like, 3-bet bluff with a King-10 off preflop and then he kept value betting, in which case, you know, this hand, like, Ace-10 suited is not the same as Pocket Nines. So I guess what I'm getting at is... Even if you want to think, oh, well, all these hands are bluff catchers on the river for the ranges we just used in the way we're talking about hands, there are going to be relevant removal effects here. And at the end of the day, whenever you're playing against real opponents, it's always very risky to assume ace-10 suited and pocket nines are the same hand. Because you never know when your opponent was going to three bet with a hand like queen-10 off preflop, and he decided to keep betting. So that's probably what I should have said earlier, rather than say I would recommend everyone calling with this specific range on the river. Don't do that. Um, I don't want anyone to ever call when they think it's negative EV. What I would say is I would recommend no one think that ace 10 suited is the same as pocket nines. Don't use the excuse, well, oh, well, I think they're both a bluff catcher in theory to do something that you think isn't plus EV. So, again, if I were playing at Nolma 200, I would probably try to call down with this range right here because I think a hand like, um, you know, ace 10 suited is not the same as pocket nines. So I think it's fine to fold pocket eights, and then I would not fold a hand like ace 10 suited. So now I wrote some analysis, and I think that's always good to do. So in this example, we get to the river with an adequate amount of bluffs. Uh, sorry, an adequate amount of bluff catchers, so our opponent can't profitably bluff with any two cards. And we can see how we should call some 9-9 and fold some 9-9. So the other thing I would write is, even though I already know this stuff, it's good to just remember it. And I know I've mentioned this several times, is this hand showcases how important it is to recognize that, in theory, it's correct to take different lines with the same hand. Against an, opt against an optimal opponent, it, uh, whatever line we take will have the same EV, but against a nemesis opponent, we must use the right frequencies. I'm just going to explain this really quickly. Let's go ahead and skip a minute or two ahead if you already know this stuff. But against an optimal opponent... A lot of times we can take the same line or two different lines with the same hand and they'll have the same EV. So since an optimal opponent will never change his strategy based on what we're doing, an optimal opponent will always just play optimal. It doesn't matter what line we take against him. But against a nemesis opponent, a nemesis opponent is someone that's capable of exploiting us perfectly, then it's important we have the right frequencies. So for example, right here against an optimal opponent, it probably doesn't matter if we call or fold with nines or eights on the river. There might be a small removal effect where maybe eights are better than nines or maybe the club is good or bad. Some really slight removal effect could matter. But for the most part, against an optimal opponent, it doesn't matter if we call or fold with nines or eights. Whereas against a nemesis opponent, we might actually have to only call with half of our pocket nines. Otherwise, he'll know we're folding too much or too little and he can exploit us. So none of this stuff should be that new. I mean, it probably is new to a few people, but a lot of the more experienced players will already know this stuff very well. But I think this hand just really showcases how important it is to recognize that you need to take multiple lines with the same hand. So if someone were to ask me, and I, I do get asked questions like this pretty often, hey, if you're in the button and the cutoff opens, what do you do with ace-10 off in the button? What do you do with king-jack off? What do you do with queen-jack off? Well, these three hands right here, it's very likely that in theory, maybe they should be called sometimes or folded sometimes or three-bit bluff sometimes. Like, let's talk about ace-10 off specifically. Ace-10 off specifically, if I had to guess, I'm guessing it's a hand that should be 3-bet sometimes, called sometimes, and folded sometimes. And it's pretty clear when you look at a spot, or when you start actually analyzing hands, like right here when we looked at this flop, this range that I used, all these hands I think are fine 3-bet bluffs. All, I mean, I think this is a fine you know, value 3-betting range, and then king-jack off and queen-jack off, I guess, are closer to bluffs than value 3-bets. But we didn't make any pairs of 10s here, so some way to fix, sort of alleviate that would be to, you know, 3-bet some ace-10 off, or 3-bet bluff some 10-8 suited, or 10-7 suited, or something like that. So just be aware, whenever you're doing examples like this, try to sort of take something from the bigger picture, and I think the bigger picture of this hand example is, you know, not only does this range work pretty well, 
the three bet calling range when we face multiple barrels on a you know a board texture that's this turn in the river you know they did miss our turn range you know we didn't hit like a queen or an ace with ace queen but our range still did okay here and it just this hand really showcases why in theory you're going to be taking multiple different line or multiple lines with the same hand because a nemesis opponent will exploit you if you don't an optimal opponent won't exploit you if you always do the same thing with the same hand but a nemesis opponent can and will and i hope it's obvious that no one is even capable of playing near optimal poker much less a nemesis opponent which would have to know exactly what your ranges are in every single hand and exploit you perfectly so don't get overly paranoid about this stuff but it's still just useful and i think kind of neat to understand it all right so we got time for one more flop so that was a good hand example i think let's hope for another good one i don't want to do clean highs all right eight eight two okay so this flop sucks for our range so let's do it all right so our total combos is 106 and then let's see how much equity our hand has. So eight, eight, two. And as I already said, I think this hand or this flop totally sucks for our range. But let's look. All right. So our oh, I, I don't want just Ace Queen, buddy. I want my whole range. Sorry about that. Let's let's put this range in right here. Okay, forty-eight percent. So even though our so our our cold calling range has a little bit less equity than it than we started with, but. Let's run through those questions real quick. How valuable is position here? Position is actually reasonably valuable on this board because the board's only eight high. So position is very useful for seeing, you know, like did an overcard turn? How does my range change based on what the overcard is? So position will be pretty useful here. It's, um, you know, it's not as useful as if the board was something like this, but it's still quite useful, even though it's a little bit what people would call drier. You know, there's not as many draws. To, there's no straight draws, so people would call it drier. But since there's so many possible overcards, position is going to be a pretty big deal. Um, and more importantly is what we talked about before. Like, this range just has uh, – let's see. This range has – if we're talking about pocket aces or pocket eights. So we have one combo of quads here and six combos of pocket aces here, whereas the button – or the button three betting range has way more premium hands. I'm counting a premium hand as kind of like jacks are better here. So like these jacks, queens, kings, or aces are pretty much never beat. They're only beat by seven hands in the cold calling range. Whereas tens and nines, you know, tens and nines are pretty good hands. But even a hand like pocket nines or pocket tens, as I'm sure everyone that plays poker is aware of, these hands are at the top of our three bet cold calling range. But on, on this flop, at least, they're some of the best hands in our range. But they're going to get outdrawn all of the time on the turn of the river, and they're already behind a good amount now. So even though these hands are close to the top of our range, they're really not that good here because overcards have like 25% equity against them. And then, as we already saw, um, the button three betting range has like has them beat 28% of the time. So it's kind of deceiving, but tens are just not that good here, even though they're at the top of our range, which is why I thought our range sucks here. So we're not donk betting here. No, 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 no. Um, right, so total combos bet is going to be zero. We're checking 105. I'm going to just start with trying to defend what, you know, I'm going to try to defend every plus EV hand that I think can be defended, but I don't think we're going to defend 70% here. So check calling range. We're just going to start throwing stuff down. Let's go. Aces are six. Tens are, tens to nines are 12 total. Pocket eights are one. That sucks. For a minute there, I was like, oh, we have some full, nope, nope, no full houses. Just one. One combo of quads. Ace queen is going to be 16. That includes the flush. Let's not double count the flush draws. So let's just put 15 for ace queen and see how many flush draws we have. We have 12 combos of flush draws. Oops. Flush draws 12. And really at this point, it is just as simple as we start adding in hands that we think are profitable to check call. So someone could easily make the argument here. And no one knows the answer to this, by the way. Someone might say like, hey, you know what? I think these are the only hands we should defend with because I think defending with any other hand is negative EV, and we, I think we should just let our opponent have this, you know, win on the flop like crazy. This range right here, if this was just our range, I think this range would be too strong. Um, and one way we could sort of look at this is we could plug this range into poker stove and see how much equity this has against our opponent's overall range. So, but that's going to be a little time-consuming, so I'm not going to do it right now or ever. But... Hopefully, most people will agree with me. This is a really strong range still. So we can add in some weaker hands. So let's just say we start adding in like, you know, let's add in the backdoor diamonds, the backdoor, you know, other, well, I guess I'm just listing backdoor diamonds. 
So let's say we add in those hands. We also maybe want to add in the ace jack with the, the ace of spades. That's three combos. So that gets us, so this, even just adding these, because these are pretty bad hands. So even just adding these seven combos will significantly weaken our range. And again, feel free to just take these ranges and play around with them in poker stuff. You'll probably learn a lot by doing that. So let's see how many combos we have here. We have six, 18, 19. That shouldn't have taken me that long to add. 34, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 53. So here we're defending about half of our range on the flop, which really doesn't seem that bad to me given how much I think this flop sucks. And again, I miss a really good hand, which would be 9-8 suited here. So that hand's actually going to strengthen our range quite a bit. So we have 56 combos here, and we should still keep adding in hands that we think are, you know, we should still keep adding in hands that we think are just plus EV to defend with. The last thing I'm going to do here, which is, I'll, I'll talk about it for a minute, and it's definitely debatable, but I'm going to check raise our pocket aces without a diamond or sorry our pocket aces without a spade um and then i'm also going to say flush draw to i don't want to list the air so i'm just going to say air three um actually let's just say we're going to do this let's just say instead we decided to check raise this air right these two air hands right here um so let's say we're check raise bluffing with the king queen of diamonds king jack of diamonds and then some other one which i didn't list like uh 10 nine of diamonds let's say for example Nope, actually, I'm not even going to do that. Let's just actually list them. Let's see if we're going to check raise Jack Nine of Diamonds, uh, Ten Nine of Diamonds, and then let's take one of them. Let's take the King Jack of Diamonds and do it with that hand. So King Jack of Diamonds. All right. So then I took off three pocket aces and I took off one King Jack, Jack of Diamonds. So that's going to get us 52 hand combos. And I'm check raising with this. Oh, I also took off two flush draws, so that'll give us 50. I'll double check it in a second. So this is going to give us some check-raising range so our opponent can't bet the flop and always be guaranteed to see a turn card. And in addition to that, not only can check-raising aces prevent us from being outdrawn by, like, just when our opponent drills some random sets or when he drills, you know, a runner, runner, flush or something like that. But when we check-raise with aces without the flush draw, it allows us to make sure we get value from our opponents, like pocket jacks, uh, pocket queens, if he has them, pocket tens type hands. Whereas if we slow play pocket aces, we can lose action. Um, and also these hands like 10, nine of diamonds, for example, three to a flush, three to a straight just plays well as a check raise bluff. So I can easily see someone saying, Hey, they don't like this check raising range. They'd rather check a call with all these hands. I think that's fine, but I'm going to go ahead and use a small check raising range prevents our opponent from always getting to see a free, um, turn card. And even though I don't think aces are ideal hands to value check raise aces without a spade do work decently well, and then I do like being able to check raise with some flush draws and these air hands. So I plug the rest of the stuff in. We're defending 55% of our checks. Who knows what's optimal, but that's just kind of my best guess, and hopefully you'll agree with me that that looks reasonable. All right, so let's randomly generate the turn. So turn is going to be... Boom. Really? All right. <laughs> um, again, it's just like the most blanks of blanks. Um, this one didn't even give us the, the turn flush draw. So we're still going to have 50, 50 combos in our checking range. Let's just say we want to check a call. 50 times 70%. That would give us 35 hand combos. We might not need to defend exactly 70%. So let's say we're going to defend. Let's just, you know, let's shoot for like 33 to 35 hand combos here. All right. So I don't think we need to check raise anything here. Remember, our aces all have the spade. Um, so they make our opponent have a few less flush draws anyways. So check a call, 33 and 35. I'm just going to list them right off. Ace, ace, three, tens to nines, 12, nine, eight suited, three, pocket eights, one. And then, you know, we would check a call with some flush draws and ace, queen. So let's just say 10, ace, queen, 15. I want to see how many combos that gets us. So that gets us three, 15, 18, 19, 29, 44. So that's way too many. So let's check off some, some ace queen. So three. So let's say we check call with like six ace queen. Okay, so this would give us 35 hand combos. And the other thing I would say is usually in videos, I sort of say, what hands do you want to check raise for value and then balance it out with the right amount of bluffs? You can also kind of go back the other way. You can say, what hands want to check raise bluff and how do I balance that with enough value hand combos? So here I have us only defending the turn by check calling which seems reasonable enough to me, 
But someone else can make the argument, which is like, hey, we have too many flush draws in our checker calling range. So because of that, we actually need to check raise all in with some flush draws and some of our either, you know, pocket aces or nine eight suited. So not only does this prevent our opponent from always getting to see a river card, it allows us to play our flush draws that have no showdown in a more effective way. So I'm again going to say, let's do that here. So let's just say we're going to check raise with two of our flush draws. So check raise, let's say the aces and then the flush draws, or let's just say the nine eight suited and the flush draws and two flush draws. This might not be correct to do that. Maybe we should just be check calling with all of these, but hopefully you get um, the general idea here, idea here, which is if we had flush draws that couldn't be played effectively as check calling, it would make it more tempting to start check raising the nine eight suited or the pocket aces. Something like that. Okay, so then we have now 30 hand combos here. So we're defending pretty aggro on the turn. We can maybe fold some of these hands, but... All right, so then on the river, let's lock the river and do this last thing. Lock turn. Boom, queen of clubs. Okay, so that river card really hit our range well. Um, it made our tens and nines weaker at least, but it, it hit our ace queens, and our opponent might not have double barreled with his ace queen, so that, that could be a pretty good river card for us. Um, it'd be better if we had check called with more ace queens, actually. So, river queen of clubs, we are going to have less hand combos now because we have to take into account the removal effect. So, let's say we have one less ace queen. So, check call. We're going to have 29 hand combos on the turn. 29 times 0 0.7 is going to be about 20. So, if we want to defend, you know, we don't need to defend quite 0.7 here. So, let's just say. You know, if our opponent bet half the pot, so let's say we want to defend like 18 hand combos here. This is going to be our aces. Oh, no, wait. yeah, our aces, our ace queen, which is going to be five, and then our tens to nines, which will get us the last all 10 combos. Okay, so you are calling down more aggressively here with these ranges that we're using. Like a lot of people in practice will fold tens or nines on the river here. Right? The river card comes... Like, what do you do in practice? The river card comes queen. Your opponent goes all in. Most people probably fold tens and nines. But they are bluff catchers. So that alone should tell you that nothing really seems wrong about defending the tens or nines. Oh, sorry. This should be nine here. We have we have uh, the combo of quads. So nothing should really seem wrong about defending the tens or nines here. But also, just in practice, like think about it. Like That river card is also a really good card to bluff. So even though it kind of sucks to call on the river expecting to, like, lose, and if you call with 10s or 9s on the river, you're going to lose more, much more often than not, but you're getting such a good price that that's totally okay. So don't let your brain get biased. Just remember, you know, when you call the river with 10s or 9s, you're calling expecting to lose, and you're getting a really good price. At the end of the day, way too many people fold on the river using the justification, like, fold because I think you're beat, or fold, I'm going to fold because I think I'm beat. It's all the time correct to call expecting to be beat, especially in a three bet pot when you're getting really good odds on the river. So again, this range looks pretty reasonable to me. So that's gonna wrap up this video. We've already run over an hour. I hope you enjoyed watching this. This was probably one of the videos I made where I learned the most while making it because this isn't stuff that I've done too much before, but it's easy to kind of see how if you understand theory and you write out your plan, it, you can kind of learn a lot so hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know if you'd like to see more videos on this specific topic. Because again, I know it's one that most people don't talk about, which probably makes it more interesting. But I don't want to get too repetitive where I'm just randomly generating flops using the same ranges. And then hopefully you really took out of this video, which is, you know, at the end of the day, if your opponent three bets you preflop, he's probably using a polarized range in a button versus cutoff situation. And, at, you know, you're going to have to end up calling down with bluff catchers on the river. It's okay to call on the river expecting to lose because you're getting such a good price. And just really respect how, in theory, you're going to be indifferent to taking this. To In theory, it's okay to take different lines with the same hand. You should be taking different lines with the same hand. And against an optimal opponent, it won't matter which line you take. Whereas against a nemesis-type opponent, you need to make sure you're defending with the right amount of combos. Otherwise, he'll exploit you. So... Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Hopefully you guys learned some stuff. Let me know what you guys think. Good luck at the tables and take care. Bye.